Thank you. Thank you for staying uh, such a late presentation. I know that you're here just because of the raffle and the beer, but I choose deliberately to ignore this fact. So thank you very much for staying, and uh, let's get to the presentation named Performance Testing Done Right. A little, uh, little information about me. So my name is Yiri Holusha. Don't worry about the pronunciation of the name. You know, I'm used to Jiri, Yiri, Siri, Jiri, whatever. And uh, seriously, even in my own company. And, uh, uh, my, and I work uh, at Hazelcast as a quality engineering team lead. Uh, besides that, I'm a true Czech person, so I like beer, I love beer, so kudos to the organizers. Perfect, perfect job done for me. Uh, I'm very happy with that. So uh, just a little motivation uh, for, the, for the beginning. In Hazelcast, so just a little show of hands. Who's familiar with Hazelcast? Heard of it, used it? Okay, sounds good, perfect. By the way, for this presentation, no knowledge of Hazelcast is needed. I was just curious. So at Hazelcast, we do three, three products, basically. We do the most known one would be in-memory data grid. Long story short, distributed cache. We do Hazelcast Jet, which is a stream processing uh, library. So again, fast stream processing uh, engine. And Hazelcast Cloud, where is a managed service of the Hazelcast IMDG. So, you know, distributed cache, fast processing uh, engine, et cetera, et cetera. So all we care about is performance. If we're not fast, then we're completely useless. Nobody will ever install a uh, slow cache, right? That's what not, not the cache is for. So we pay close attention to performance at Hazelcast. We test it very, uh, as much as possible. And uh, during my uh, days in Hazelcast and also in Red Hat uh, when I was working on InfiniSpan, uh, I was still seeing those same patterns or same uh, you know, glitches that can be done better during performance testing. And I would like to focus this presentation not only obvious things like the warm-up. I'm not going to talk about you know, that we have to do warm-up of, of our applications when we're doing performance testing because the JIT compiler will kick in and it will optimize everything and it will then become so much faster. Now, uh, everybody knows that this is a room full of very skilled developers. I know that this is an awesome conference, so I'm not going to say a word about warm-up or uh, stuff, stuff that everybody knows. So let's try to focus on some other maybe non-obvious but still trivial things to notice, to get right. Before we start, uh, just a, two slides about the terminology so we would be on the same page. So, in performance testing, we have two basic metri metrics for you know, describing the performance of the system. First of all is the throughput, which is a number of operations per, uh, per time of unit. Number of operations per second, the typical example. And the other one would be latency, or AKA response time, which is a, which is a time from starting the request, or you know, sending the operation, invoking the method, whatnot, to actually getting the response. Sending a REST call, calling a method, sending, uh, you know, uh, sending the value over the network and getting the, getting the value back. This is the operation. And we're measuring the latency, latency of it. The other thing that I would like to get straight up now is the type of the performances. This division is uh, like, this is kind of my uh, division and I will just try to justify it in front of you uh, in, in, next, uh, in, in, in the talk. But uh, I divide it into two, let's say, let's say types of tests. And that would be the first one would be the performance test, the real performances for throughput and latency test, which you actually get the numbers, where you compare the numbers that you get as a result. For throughput test, obviously, the higher the throughput, the better. You know, we're trying to get as, or execute as many operations as possible. And for the latency test, we fix the throughput and then measure the response time for the single operations. I will talk about it uh, later as well. And there is another category called stability, like I, I call it stability testing, but it's also uh, it's some well-known uh, uh, literature. So the output of that, uh, of that test is when we're trying to push the system to the limits and we are observing whether uh, it's stable, if, it's, if it can hold up to that particular load. So, and the answer is yes or no. Okay, the system will remain stable. Or no, the same system will crash, the JVM will crash, we have a memory leak, whatnot. So this is the basic divisions that I will be operating through, up, uh, through uh, this presentation. So, 
The presentation is structured in the following way. I will present five, let's say, problems or maybe things to think about. Uh, I will always describe it, then show an ex uh, example of it, either chart or some, uh, uh, you know, table result, something, and then propose a solution or uh, give a takeaway what, uh, how, to, how to avoid it in the, in the future or just think about it. So let's get started. Um, so uh, I like to start with the, with the problem. I, I like to use metaphors. So I'm actually getting married in two, two months. And, uh, and uh, people, and, uh, from, from my point of view, uh, I think that the life before the marriage and after the marriage will not be different. And every single married, married man will tell me that I'm wrong. So I need not distinguishing between those before and after. Okay, maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Maybe I will tell you uh, that I was wrong, you know, in, in two, three, three months. So let's not do the same, uh, ish, uh, the same problem, the same mistake during performance testing. Let's distinguish between those two categories would be latency test and throughput test. Why? Because what I see very, very often is that the people, uh, the engineers or the testers or who, who you know, whoever, uh, execute the throughput test and then look at the latencies and compare the latencies uh, between them. Why is that uh, not a good idea? I'm not saying that it's completely useless, but why isn't it uh, a good idea? You know, uh, when you're doing a performance test, you will always get a fluctuations of the results. You know, you will execute it for the first time, you will get 100 operations. Then you will execute it on the second time, exactly the same setup on exactly the same machine. You will get 105 operations. Then you will have 97 operations, et cetera, et cetera. So if the throughput is actually fluctuating, so how can you, you know, uh, how can you take a look at the, compare the latencies between each other? Because one of the parameters is actually moving. So that's the problem that we kind of need to think about. And uh, we do this, why, I, I was always wondering why we're doing this. And uh, the thing is that latency and throughput are often, very often related. You know, the lower the latency, the higher the throughput. Because if one operation takes lower amount of time, I, I will be able to make, you know, more operations, obviously. It's basically an inverse and vice versa. This is, this holds true mostly for single threaded applications, you know, all, almost all the time. But uh, in, a, in a concurrent, especially in the concurrent uh, environment or distributed environment, this might not hold up. And let me show you an example of optimizations or, you know, that you, uh, let's say that you're developing a feature or a, optimi a performance optimization when uh, you're trying to like do implementation number one, implementation number two, and then you want to compare uh, which one is better to decide which, which way to go. So one of the first uh, one of the first optimization you might do uh, so that on the left column you will see uh, you know sending queries sending operations and uh, we're processing them as they come you know query number one query number two three four and they dif uh, they take different times right obvious the simplest thing you can ever do so what about uh, we did uh, some kind of uh, time sliced round robin fashion that you actually have a fixed time slots and you're uh, executing the operation, and if it finishes in the time slot, good. If it doesn't finish, you pause it, you move to the other operation, and then come back to it. So this is exactly what's, what's on the right side. From this diagram, what we see, obviously, is that the throughput will remain the same, right? The will, it will not get better, but the latency might get better, actually. The latency, for instance, for the, for the queries three and four, I see that the that the time that they finished is much, much earlier. And for queries one and two, it's, let's say, slightly worse. Slightly worse. Of course, it depends on the, on the specific use case. But this optimization might actually improve your latency and do nothing to your throughput. Actually, it might worst, uh, make, make your throughput worse, obviously, because you know, the uh, pausing, uh, pausing the operation and restoring in and moving to another and pausing in, etc. It's an overhead. It's an overhead that you're that uh, and you're not ex actually executing the operation. You're doing something on the infrastructure. So you actually might get worse throughput with better latency. Suddenly, it doesn't hold up. Let's try the uh, the other way around. A typical example when you want to uh, get better throughput. 
and do not do anything to latency, is a web server. You have one response thread, okay? And if I had 10 threads, and I haven't done anything to the thread, like I haven't optimized anything in that thread, so that means the thread will always, it will be serving the request still with the same latency. But now I can do 10, thread, uh, 10 requests in parallel. So obviously increasing the throughput. And again, because I'm putting more load on the system, the latency will probably get worse because the, late, the, the system might get you know, uh, under bigger pressure. So that's the other way around. You get the better throughput and worse latency. So th this is, this is uh, th what I wanted to show you, that, that intuitive, that the intuitive m meaning that the latency and throughput always correlates, it's an inverse of one of each other, does not hold all the time. So what, what to, what's, what's the takeaway? I call it the solution, but it's not a solution. It's the takeaway. It's what you should be thinking about is that when you're actually trying to, you know, you're doing an optimization, and you should think of, okay, this optimization will do, I expect that latency will go down, up, whatever, the throughput will, you know, change in that way, and you should test it separately. You, want, you always want to isolate as much as possible the things that you're testing, because you know the more parameters are changing, the more fluctuations you get, and it can always, uh, if you if you it might if you get better fluctuations, it may lead you to the wrong direction. Wrong direction. You have two implementations, and then you you choose the other one just because you didn't fix the throughput. You know computers have bad days. Uh, uh, sometimes you know sometimes perform 50 operations, sometimes 100. You know sometimes your uh, very happy colleague will uh, run a uh, background to the the process there and you don't notice. So it happens. So there's a first takeaway. Distinguish, think about what you're testing, what, uh, what you're developing or what, 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 you want to, what you want to test. So problem number two, inadequate load uh, on, the, on the system. So uh, have you ever, you know, uh, I might use my fiance in this presentation a bit too much, so please don't be offended. So, uh, have you ever heard that, like, you, you, you asked, uh, what, what, is something happening, something wrong? No, nothing. It's a trap, you know? It's a trap. We know, we all know it. It can lead you into bad directions. So, what, uh, what I mean in, uh, in the performance point of view is that putting an adequate load during the testing is very important. You cannot just put, you know, like, 10 stressor threads or 100 stressor threads just just like, you know, I, I'll put 100 because I like the, like the, like the number. And why? This is, the, this is the why, why, why. So if, you, if you're pushing the, uh, the system over the limit, you know, the system will probably like, do a lot of context switching, it will be overwhelmed, and you're actually not testing your optimization anymore. You're testing how the system behaves. You're testing its stability. So it may, again, lead you in the wrong direction. The same thing goes when you don't stress the system enough. And let me show you again examples. So this is an example. Uh, I hope it's kind of visible. I didn't want to, you know, nicer the, the charts because these are actually these, these are some of the charts that are actually generated using Hazelcast. So what it shows: uh, the red line. This one is the, we have clients. We have eight clients on one one machine. You don't have to know the details, but the thing is that, okay, I have eight stressor entities on one machine. I put 16 on them, okay, the throughput increases, it scales, Hazelcast scales, we're great. And uh, then you put 24, and uh-oh, it doesn't, scare, uh, it doesn't uh, scale anymore. Like, so the first, first hypothesis is like, okay, the servers are not able to keep up anymore. That's a, that's a valid hypothesis, but if I actually try to use those 24 clients on two machines, you know, 12 and 12, the throughput is right there, is, is the pink line uh, uh, above, right there. I'm a volleyball player. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so this, this hypothesis uh, is not correct. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a server mistake, it's a client mistake. And what we found in this particular case was that on the client machine, the, there were so many threads on, one uh, on the one client machine that the threads were actually fighting over the resources. They were doing context switching, so not doing anything useful. Thus, 
not performing as they could. So this actually might mislead us again, because we're, if we're doing some optimization on the client side, we don't see the effect of our optimization. We see how the client behaves under uh, you know, uh, extreme, extreme load, extreme stress, hiding the effects. The numbers that, that we saw here, uh, sorry, spoiled. Uh, the numbers that we saw here were actually hiding the optimizations before it, behind it. Let's try it the other way around. I, t I told you that the not enough load might be misleading as well. So this is another, another chart, the, uh, very, very similar scenario. We have one client, our, our Hazelcast clients are uh, highly optimized for multi-threaded environments. So uh, we have, we compared, we have one, uh, yeah, four clients, four clients on that one machine, each driven by just one thread, one Java thread. And the blue line is that we have just one client operated by four threads. So in total, we have still four threads to be stressing the cluster, stressing the members, stressing the servers, whatnot. You know, so four and four, it should be the same. You see the drastic, you know, it's more than 200%. It's, it's a drastic difference. Why, you might ask? I can give you our, our explanation for that. Uh, because Cla Hazelcast client is very optimized for, uh, for a multi-threaded environment. We have thread pools there, so for uh, get, uh, IO uh, request, uh, oh, sorry, IO receive thread and IO response thread and operation thread and computation thread. So we had those thread pools, and every time the message comes at one thread pool, that it handles to the other, and then it handles to the other, and it creates a lot of threads. And what was actually happening in this particular case, that the one client, you know, created all those thread pools, but the threads were not busy enough. So what the thread does, for instance, the IO thread. It like received something, nothing to do, let's go to sleep. <sighs> Wake up, okay, here's nothing, uh, go to sleep. Wake up, go to sleep, Wake up. So not doing any useful work. This is, this is the key point, that we, are, we, were not, we were not stressing our software to the, optimal, to the optimal level of performance. And I'm talking, uh, you know, it's a completely valid scenario. For instance, you know, if a customer wants to use it like this, you know, go <laughs> if you want. It's a, it's a bad idea, but if you want. But when you're trying to decide, as you as a developer, if you want to try to decide whether your implementation rate or optimization is better or worse than the other one, you actually want to have the good numbers. You have to test the optimization, not the things around it. So the only takeaway, the, the takeaway from this is to actually get to know your software, to actually understand how your software is designed and how it behaves in the, in the perf uh, from a performance point of view. And the only way how to do it is testing. You have to try, you have to, you have to test it, and then and every time understand, try to understand why it's behaving in such a way. So every time I do p performance benchmarking against you know, some performance benchmarking on maybe some different machines that I don't know because we have a performance lab you know, in-house. So, so I, if I'm uh, per benchmarking in uh, AWS, so I start small. I start small, then adding the load. I'll see where I'm hitting the, hitting the ceiling, actually. And then I can decide, I can decide based on that, based on my knowledge of the software, I can, I can uh, decide what's the optimal load that will actually produce me good results and I will be testing the, the feature that I'm imp implementing. So every time, please try going slow, understanding the results step by step, and you will see, you will also understand your uh, software from a performance point of view much better. Let's go uh, to another one. Um, so, um, when, uh, when we had uh, our first anniversary, um, I didn't forget, by the way. I didn't forget, but we went on a ball. And I got so drunk that I wasn't able to like, dance through the night. And she was expecting that. And since then, I was always a perfect gentleman on all the anniversaries, all the birthdays, and what's, what that, whatnot. But she forgets this all good, and she takes the bad. Yeah, my fault, I know. So. <laughs> So the thing is that uh, she's actually throwing away information. And that's 
uh, there's the other, there's the, there's the next problem that I want to describe. Now, so we started with, we know whether we're testing throughput or latency. We now know that we have to think about the load that we're pushing into it, pushing on the system. And now let's focus on the latency tests. So I see that the, you know, the, the typical things that you can do is that the measure latency of each operation. And m very often I see this thing that we collect all shitload of operation and uh, then we show, we show to the product manager or to, to ourselves or somebody only an average. In a very bad case, only an average. So then somebody shows, you know, uh, minimum, maximum, and an average. Still, it's still pretty bad, still not enough information. Even better, they will, uh, better they will serve, they will, they will show you the percentiles. Okay, the 50 percentile, 75 percentile, 90, 99, 99, 99, etc. Okay, better, still better. Even better, we can do to show the whole latency distribution, the whole histogram, to get the full picture. And I'm saying this is still not enough. And by the way, like 90% of people that I, that I saw doing performance testing were not even showing the full latency distributions. So can we do it even better? Can we actually show more, uh, more information? Let me, let me uh, show you some uh, computation or show you the properties of, that, uh, of those averages, min, max. This is actually an arbitrary data set because I didn't want to make it too big, but I've seen I've seen performance test results that were actually like this, and mixing. So you can see that from the data set A, the average is 16, and at B, it's 12. So it's A is worse, let's say. And then with the minimum, A is better. And then with the maximum, B is better. And then P12, P20, P50, P80, A is better. But P90, B is better. How can you decide which one is better? How? I don't know because you cannot. That's the, that's the thing, you have to specify your requirements and mo even, uh, even, even better, you, sh you should see the whole latency distribution. So, sorry, so let me show you, this is, you, uh, you, still, you don't have to really understand uh, all, the, all the details, but th these are the percentiles. In Hazelcast, we only care about the, higher, the highest percentiles, but we can also generate the lower ones. But, in here, this, is, this, was actually, this was actually the optimization that I show you in the step, uh, step one, when we where they did the time-sliced round-robin uh, optimization. So it actually drastically improved the latency against that, uh, the state before. So I see the distribution of the latency. I see the 99 percentile is somewhere there, whereas for the red line, the 99 percentile is way above. So I see immediately that the blue line it's much better from the latency point of view. This gives me the full picture. I'm not losing any information. I'm not forgetting about any goodness that he brought me the flower. Okay? And I'm saying, uh, can we do even more? Because this is what you, histogram is, is containing all the information. So what, what am I saying to get even more? And the thing is that uh, when you look at the chart, this is a summary you know, this is a histogram at the end of the whole test. Does it show you, that, can, it, can it show you that there's actually something wrong going on from, let's say, latency, latency point of view, from performance point of view? No, you cannot see it because, you know, you see, okay, the 90 percentile, it's, it looks okay-ish, let's say. But if I, uh, from the same run, if I chart the latencies, this is the, this is the 50 percentile evolving over the time. So, so 50 percentile at 10 seconds, 50 percentile or 20 seconds, 30 seconds, etc. So I see the percentiles actually growing, uh, you know, developing all the time. And in here, I immediately see that the, la the latency is growing over time, over the period of the two-minute test. So this signalizes a problem, right? And we're all Java developers here. So what might be the obvious? Uh, what was the root cause of, you know, kind of system slowing down continuously? Garbage collection, right? Garbage collection. This is the, when I when I look at the chart. I'm my first candidate is garbage collection. So let's look at just just to prove my myself. Uh, let's look at the another chart which proves, you know, this this was this was the GC statistics of the young space uh, during that run. It was actually memory leak. 
but I wouldn't have got that from this chart. This looks legit to me. This looks perfectly legit. So the takeaway, another takeaway from this, from this problem, from this, uh, from this issue, is uh, to not throw any information. You know, you have, if you have the information, don't throw it away. Use it. Generate all the charts that you possibly can. Throughputs, latency, system statistics, collect it. You know, memory management, stat network, network statistics, CPU, GC info, whatever. Collect everything. Collect everything and then look at everything. Like just, you know, you will, you will get the pattern. You will get the pattern. You will know where to look at uh, after, after some practicing. But if you, if you have, if, you, if you're serious about the performance testing and performance, thus performance, you have to understand what's going on underneath. And for that, you need as, ma as much information as possible. A great tool for this is HDR histogram. It's a, it's a library written in Java by Gil Tene. He's a CTO, C something O of Azul Systems. Great guy, one of my heroes. I would love to meet him. He's here? No, he's not. And uh, he wrote this uh, HDR histogram uh, uh, library, which helps you compu compute all the uh, percentiles from your data set and uh, some other nice, nice things. So this is definitely a, a great tool to, to have or to use when you're serious about uh, latency, latency measuring. I will also measure, uh, I will, sorry, I will also mention his presentation at the end of the talk, which is very great about latency, uh, latency testing. Okay, problem number four, an unexpected uh, operations ratio. For this one, I have no good metaphor for my fiance, so sorry. And um, uh, the, things, uh, the, the things like that, uh, we, we, have, we have our system, and it uh, usually can do more than one thing, right? Typical reads and writes. And we get the, let's say, customer scenario that we should test this. And they, they, they tell us that, OK, we have 80% of gets and 20% of puts. This is, by the way, typical caching scenario in the, in the distributed system. And this is very, very often a requirement. So we want, to, uh, we want to test this scenario, you know, set up the test, and we'll see how the, you know, testing the optimization, let's say, or customer fix based on, you know, on their particular use case. And what we might do, what, uh, what might happen, is that we accidentally end up with a different ratio that, uh, that we wanted to. How? You might. Not because I'm an idiot, but maybe, you know, and I am. So uh, the test setup, very, you know, the first thing that might came, came to, come to your mind would be to set up 100 clients, 80 clients just doing reads, read, 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 and 12, 20 clients doing puts. Obviously, 80-20 ratio, right? However, the operations usually, or not usually, they, they don't last the same time. They don't, take the, they don't have the same latency. So for illustration, you have the read uh, to take just one millisecond and write two milliseconds. So it's two times slower. So let's do some math. Let's do some basic elementary school math. So the read client does uh, 1,000 operations per second. The write client does 500 operations per second. So let's uh, run the test for five minutes, shall we? So 10, uh, 1,000 times 60 seconds ta -ta 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 -ta, times 80 clients, we have 24 million operations. Reads, sorry, reads. And then we get 3 million, opera uh, 3 million writes. If you divide it, the, ending, the end ratio is 80, it's off by 10%. And obviously, the, the longer the test will run, the bigger the difference will be. So this is maybe something that you might not expect. Like it, it's trivial when you when you see it. It's completely trivial, you know. And we can go all go. We can all go for a beer. But uh, it's you know. It's I, I wish that somebody would have told me some of those things three years ago. By the way, it's the takeaway. It it might be a complete valid scenario. It might be that your that your customer, your user, is actually using it in such a way. That's completely per it's perfect, perfectly valid scenario. However. Sometimes it's not, and usually, from my experience, it's not. You know, there, there's just a client doing puts and gets or uh, reads and writes based on the on the current uh, you know, workflow or whatnot. So 
the first thing that you can do is to actually get uh, more information about the scenario and make sure that this is what they really want, what you should really test. Or if it's not what you should really test, you can uh, do a fix to your benchmarking tool that you can uh, generate the operations. You can make all the clients equal and generate the operations based uh, on probability, you know, like a random in divided modulo something, you know, some, some very simple, simple thing. But all the clients are then equal. And you will actually get much closer, you will get, you will get to the ratio that you actually want it. Cool? So that might be another thing that, you know, might not be so obvious. It's now, it, now it's obvious, but uh, I was really surprised one, one time when I look at the absolute numbers. So, and the last, uh, last uh, thing, last uh, problem is performance regression. And uh, I would end it with the metaphor, uh, you know, I think going back to your ex-partner is a really bad idea. So that's just my, uh, that's just my uh, opinion. And, uh, so, and with performance, it's even worse. Because this is the worst thing that you can happen. You're developing a new shiny 2.0 version. Somebody installs it and the, th and the performance is like 10% lower. So that's something that's, uh, that's not nice. And especially if you're focused on the performance, if, you're, if your uh, software is wrapped up around performance, just like the Hazelcast one is. Customer, customers are unhappy. They are pretty angry, actually. And uh, it's, uh, it's not a nice mindset to go back instead of going forward. So how to, uh, how to avoid it? Uh, obviously, you have to test it. You have to, you have to continuously test your, uh, your software, you know, and I, I will show you just how we, how we do it. But the, but the solution or the takeaway is do you have to pay attention to it. You have to, and, and, the, and the right way, or the, I think the only way that works, is to automate all the stuff because nobody will ever like you know you, I can I can tell you to write write the uh, sorry run the performance test every day and then look at the results nobody will ever keep up every day or write it in the different scenarios you know you have endless numbers of scenarios so the key point here is the automation and once you actually do the test you store the results you don't just have it on your local machine, you know, stored in an Excel file or a CSV file or something like that. You actually should store it somewhere so you can come back to that, uh, come back to that in the future. If you don't have the history, you cannot claim the regression, obviously. So, uh, and check and check the check the results on a regular basis or even better automatically. I can show you just a short preview. Show uh, short. Um, uh, short demo of the application uh, that we use uh, that we use for uh, storing performance, storing and analyzing performance as results. Let me just look. Yeah, I'm still at the PN. Perfect. So this is a this is a, an application that we call Perfrepo Performance Results Repository. And here you have uh, these were just like uh, configuration issues, so don't pay attention to it. But we ha here we have a history over time of the, for instance, of the scenario with put throughput one with the 100 kilobyte values. And we store it, this, these results are somewhere from December when we, uh, I, I did it in, uh, in, the, in the JDG, in InfiniSpan, in Red Hat, and then I brought this uh, to, uh, to Hazelcast as well. Uh, so uh, we have, we can immediately see whether the re uh, regression is happening or not. In the, on the right side, you, might, you, see, you see the drop. I can immediately see that something went wrong. So I go there and investigate. In this case, this was, the, this was a, a friendly, uh, friendly colleague executing something on the machine while this is running automatically. And this is all running automatically. Every day, you know, we have the continuous integration tools and your benchmarking. And just if you automate everything, it works. If, uh, if you pay, and then you pay attention a bit to it. But uh, you have something to actually back up your uh, back up your claims that you're not hitting the regressions. We also store we store the results. Oh, okay. I need to just uh, relock. Okay, and we store we store the results. We tag it so we can actually find find any um, any uh, result in the past. So 
just uh, just a quick demonstration. If I want to see the results for 3.11 version, I will just search by text, and so that is a arbitrary text that you can you know customize it uh, to your wishes. I I recommend using something like that or thinking about preparing yourself to prevent performance regression because that's not something that you want to uh, that you want to have. All right, uh, let's let's move. These are uh, some of the useful resources that uh, that I think uh, that, that are that are very useful. The first one, Gil Tennis presentation, how not to measure latency. Absolutely brilliant, uh, brilliant presentation about about measuring latency, about the caveats of it, about a big big problem that I didn't mention here because it's a you know it's a separate presentation actually done by Gil Tennis. Uh, coordinated, co sorry, coordinated omission problem. So I recommend you, if you're interested in it, watch that presentation. It's a one hour long presentation or two hour long in Hebrew. So, you know, yeah, suits your needs. Also, optimizing Java, pretty, pretty nice, pretty nice book uh, with all the, also some kind of low level stuff about the JVM, but not that much. And the really low level thing, system performance by Brandon Gregg. That's uh, pretty, uh, for me, it was the hard, uh, hardest one to read. Since I have still some time, because uh, when I'm a bit nervous, I speak uh, faster, so I actually prepared a bonus, uh, bonus slide. I was, uh, I was thinking about that. So, um, so a short quiz, just a very short quiz. This is the test setup. Uh, we, uh, we have two servers, two clients, you know, all in separate machines, what not. And the client is sending uh, is sending values, you know, like a put request via REST or you know or via our protocol, with uh, different value sizes. Like these are three scenarios: one kilobyte, ten kilobyte, and one hundred kilobyte values. We measure it, okay, perfect, and we get the we get the throughput uh, throughput results. So for one kilobyte, we had one hundred, approximately one hundred thousand operation. For ten kilobyte, we had 10,000, 11,000 operation, and for one kilobyte, uh, 100 kilobyte values, we get like a thousand and, uh, and something. So when I look at the results, where you look at the results, this is uh, this is uh, you know question for you. So do you see anything strange? Is there are those uh, results correct? Any ideas what might be wrong with this? Sorry. Performance is dropping on one kilobyte. Uh, that might be actually like uh, you know it's uh, still kind of kind of you know because you have uh, ten ten times larger value and you have ten times lower throughput. It kind of makes sense, you know, uh, approximately. Exactly. So the answer was. We are not. We are actually not testing the system, but we are testing the network. Because what what do these numbers look like? They are too perfect. It scales too perfect, you know. And this is the this is the big biggest takeaway I can I can give you that if something looks too perfect in the performance testing, it's usually wrong. It's like it's it never. You always have to think whether the numbers add up. So. It scales, I, I get 10 times bigger value and I get 10 times lower throughput. And 10 times bigger value and almost exactly 10 times lower throughput. In this particular case, by the way, this was found, uh, this issue was found during the uh, setup of the performance regression testing uh, environment. So it was, it was too perfect and we found out that the machines that we were executing it on had only one gigabit network card. And if you actually multiply the numbers, it's one gigabit. You know, the, the basic, I, have, I should have a small beast there, sorry. But uh, the, the basic math will prove you that you're actually hitting the ceiling. Then you can confirm it with other tools like nload. You see the full saturation of the network. But the, for, in, in the first, you know, in the, when you look at the numbers for the first time, you'll be like, okay, this is pretty sweet, yeah? We're really good. <laughs> Hazelcast is scaling linearly. <laughs> no, no, it was uh, it was a mistake. And of course, when you think about it, it doesn't make sense because uh, uh, because when you, for instance, when you're sending one kilobyte values, 
You know, you open a socket, send a kill by value, close the socket. Open a socket, send, close the socket. And you do it 100 times more than in a 100 kilobyte value scenario, right? The opening, the opening and closing happens only twice, whereas it, there it happens like 200 times. So that's, you know, it's all connected. And I think that one of the biggest, you know, the, the most important things in performance testing in general is when you get the results, sit, you know, sit for a while, look at the results and think. Really think if they make sense, if the numbers add up, if, the, if, it's, if it's behaving as you would uh, foresee, if you, if you would expect, as you would expect. Because it's very often that, it, that the numbers just don't add up and you, you must not accept the numbers just because the, the test, you know, was successful. You know, Green, Tick and Jenkins or something. So that's my uh, that's my message uh, to you. Uh, I yeah, I think I th this was exactly how I wanted to plan it. So that's uh, that's all from my side, and uh, I'm ready for c questions if you have any. Okay, sure. Yes. Right. Okay, so the question was whether, uh, I guess you haven't heard it. So the question was whether the, there is any open source project like the dashboard that I just showed for storing the perform and analyzing performance uh, results and also for storing micro benchmarking also integrated with Jenkins somehow. Uh, the question is yes, and it's this tool. It's open sourced, by the way. It's, uh, it's named Perfrepo. I was developing it in, in Red Hat, and I actually didn't provide the link there because I'm a, I'm a bit ashamed of the documentation <laughs> right now because still, it's still uh, in, a, in a work in progress, but we use it. We use all the main, main parts. Uh, how it works? It's a simple web application. It's basically, you know, uh, Postgres database storing there. Uh, it has no notion of... Uh, of understanding the results, actually, that it just stores the uh, number value there, and you you have a REST client where you send you you create you create the, those entities and you send it to that web, web application. So you can actually store anything you want there. You can actually bend it uh, through uh, you know different requirements. When I was uh, developing this in Red Hat, I was spreading this uh, perf repo usage. Uh, uh, tool usage, and uh, in the end, it was uh, before I left, it was 14 different teams using it, so it was very flexible. But yeah, we can, uh, I could definitely use a contributor, because I'm uh, really uh, not, yeah, not able to keep up right now with the development, because uh, right now it has all, all the things that I need. But we can definitely, you know, you can ping me on Twitter, we can work uh, something out, I will be happy to uh, get you engaged with it. Any other questions? Okay, there's something on the ceiling, I see, okay. <laughs> In that case, yeah, sorry. Do you use uh, some kind of tools which uh, measure the overall performance of a system? Uh, this way you, you can uh, detect some saturation of uh, CPU, memory, network, or something like that. I see. Okay. Uh, in case of in case of Hazelcast, we're doing a library. We are, we are developing, you know, IMDG the library. So we're not having an actual like system. We're not uh, doing any, you know, uh, end application. So uh, uh, we we have our proprietary testing tool, you know, suited for our needs. Uh, but we also we all, we measure all the things like uh, you know. But we're not running anything in production. I mean, this way. But, uh, I, you know, there, are, there is this, you know, uh, for instance, Apache JMeter, you know, and Gatling, and I, you know, uh, how, how is it called, the last one? I, I will remember uh, afterwards. Uh, so there are a number of tools. I know that there are a number of tools, but I, I don't have any particular experience because I was only, always working with the, you know, lower level uh, of the system. So we were measuring the more isolated uh, part of the system. Edmond? Edmond. So, so Edmond is a Unix tool 
that gives you an overview of the CPU, the disks, the network, and uh, that can stream the, the measures over time so that you can record them and mm -hmm. see the evolution over time. I see. Okay, cool. Yeah, but I don't have any uh, personal experience with that, sorry. But you know, the, the, the methodology applies still the same. It's about you know, using a different tool suited for your needs, but uh, you know, these are the things that you should not forget or should, should be aware of. Sometimes there are perfectly valid scenarios. I already got to, okay. Yeah, another question. Do you think it's a, a good point to measure the power consumption of the devices? Uh, if I think that it's uh, good to measure? The power consumption. The pa power, so sorry? Power consumption. consumption. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, you, you mean you know, power, power consumption, okay. Uh, I guess it depends on your use case, you know. We, we <laughs> Seriously, we don't care about we don't care about uh, power consumption because we are not running the software, so we're not paying for the electricity. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, but uh, what we what we actually measure is the utilization of the of the machine, right? Because that can tra that can transform into uh, into the power consumption. Uh, but yeah, you know, you should measure anything that that's important to you. You know, we, I'm talking about performance, but uh, you sh you, if, if uh, memory management or uh, you know memory statistics are important to you or some other stuff, you should definitely measure it. You know, but these these are like the things, the methodology of of uh, that can be that can be applied also to different different measures. But no, I uh, yeah, we're not running any any application. We're not running any servers. You know, we're buying them for uh, from AWS, for instance. And when we have some of the in-house uh, performance testing labs. We are happy to spend the money on it because that's all we care about. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. I have never thought of that. The measuring thing. Yeah. Can you do just like uh, in a house? You you would type down your uh, state of, <laughs> of the electricity me measurement and then. Yeah, I don't know. No, I have no experience with that. Any other question? Okay, I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Enjoy your beer.